In the last video, I've presented the Solus One model without technological progress and without population growth. This is the simplest version of the model that we can think of, and we've already seen that nevertheless we can get some basic insights into convergence processes and differences in the uh, steady states between different economies. However, we've also talked about the fact that we cannot explain long-run growth with such a model, but if we add technological progress, then we can explain the trend growth rate of economies such as the United States and Germany. Now, in this video, I'd like to present the more sophisticated version of the Solus One model with technological progress and with population growth. The sources stay the same, the original article by Robert Solow of 1957 and the article by Trevor Swan of 1956 and uh, the chapter four of my book to, written together with David Bloom, Automation and its Macroeconomic Consequences, Theory, Evidence and Social Impacts. Now again, we remember what we want to explain. If we look here at the evolution of uh, the logarithm of GDP per capita in the United States and Germany, then we see we have a remarkably constant long run uh, trend increase. That's the first stylized fact that we would like to explain. Then we have a persistent gap between the two economies, which we want to explain, and we have this convergence phase of Germany after the Second World War that we've already described in the previous um, video, and we will see that also this extended version of the model, of course, can um, explain it. Now we again have the production function that relates aggregate output or GDP of the country to the input factors, capital, and labor, where labor is multiplied with productivity, labor productivity, so we have effective labor here within parentheses, and we have the output elasticity of capital, which is alpha, and the output elasticity of effective labor, which is one minus alpha. Alpha is between zero and one, as before, and now we have that the population size or the labor force, which is again the same, is allowed to grow over time, and the same holds true for labor productivity. Here, labor productivity appears in labor augmenting form as before, so it's multiplied with the production factor labor, and we will see that this enables the derivation of a balanced growth path, basically. And we have capital, machines, factories, infrastructure, and so on. And this is again, as in the previous version of the model, an accumulated production factor. So capital builds up according to the investment decision of investors in the economy. So the crucial differences to the basic version of the model without technological progress and without population growth is that we now have growth in technologies. So the time derivative of the stock of technologies divided by the level of technologies, that's the growth rate of technologies, that's positive and denoted by GA. And the growth rate of the population is the time derivative of the labor force divided by the size of the labor force. And this is given by N, the population growth rate. And now if we would derive the model again in per capita terms, then we could not draw a solo diagram simply because of the fact that all the per capita variables would actually grow over time. So we would have to draw a new diagram at each instant because all the curves would evolve basically. To get rid of this uh, feature, we use a different transformation here, namely a transformation in uh, efficiency units. So we denote by lowercase letters with a tilde where aggregate variables that are divided by the efficiency units of labor in the economy. Because at the new steady state of this version of the model, the transformed variables would stay constant. So we can again draw a solo diagram in the transformed variables. And then from this solo diagram in transformed variables, move on to describe what happens to per capita capital and per capita GDP. And we also do the same for GDP, so we have GDP per unit of effective labor, that's aggregate GDP divided by the product of uh, labor productivity and the number of workers. Now here on this slide, we have the main complication that arises due to the fact that we now allow for technological progress and population growth. Now we need to compute the evolution of capital per unit of effective labor over time. So we take the time derivative of this variable. However, we know the definition of capital per unit of effective labor is that we have the aggregate capital stock divided by 
um, the stock of technologies and the labor force. However, all three of these variables depend on time. So when we take the time derivative, we have to apply the quotient rule in this derivation. In the previous version of the model, where we assumed constant population and a constant uh, level of technologies, um, we simply could calculate the evolution of capital per worker as the time derivative of the aggregate capital stock divided by the number of workers, because only capital dependent on time. Now, here all three variables depend on time, and so we have a more complicated derivation. So what we do now is we apply the quotient rule, and the quotient rule here implies that we need to take the derivative of the numerator with respect to time, that's k dot, and multiply it with the denominator without any changes. So we have k dot times al. Then we take the negative of the numerator unchanged, multiplied with the time derivative of the denominator. Now the denominator is again a product of two variables that both depend on time, so we have to apply the product rule inside of this der um, time derivative. So when we take the product rule of a times l, we have that we have the derivative of a with respect to time times l plus the, uh, a unchanged times the derivative of l with respect to time. Now that's the whole numerator of this expression. And then in the quotient rule, we know that we also have to divide by the denominator squared. So then we have the whole expression where we applied the quotient rule and inside the quotient rule, the product rule to get this expression here. Now we can simplify. So we can divide the first term here by AL squared. We see that one AL cancels out from the numerator and the denominator. So what remains is the time derivative of capital from here divided by A times L. In the second term here, we have minus K times A dot and one L from the numerator cancels with one L from the denominator. So we have divided by A squared times L. And in the third term, when we divide a times l dot by a l squared, one a drops out from the numerator and the denominator. So we have k times l dot divided by a l squared. And then we can simplify further. We know that k divided by a times l is k tilde by definition. So what we have in this term is k tilde times the time derivative of a divided by a. And we know already that this is uh, the rate of technological progress, so we can plug it in here. And with the third uh, term here, we have again k tilde, because we have k divided by a times l, but now multiplied by the time derivative of l over l, and that's the population growth rate times k tilde. So if we uh, simplify the whole thing, we get the first expression here, k dot over a l minus the rate of technological progress times k tilde minus the rate of uh, population growth times k tilde. Now we still want to get rid of the aggregate variables that we have here. So we do this by reformulating the aggregate capital accumulation equation, where we know that this is um, equal to gross investment minus depreciation. So that's net investment in aggregate terms. Now we can plug in uh, for investment, the behavioral um, assumption that individuals save a constant fraction of their total income. And then we plug in the production function for um, income and we get this expression for the aggregate capital accumulation equation. And now we divide this by the efficiency units of labor. So we divide this expression by A times L. Then we get K dot divided by A times L on the left hand side. We get the production function divided by A times L. So again, A times L drops out here and we have A times L to the power of alpha in the denominator. We can summarize this together with K to the power of alpha from the numerator to this expression here to the power of alpha. And we have here minus delta times aggregate capital divided by the efficiency units of labor. And then we know by definition, this is K tilde. This is also k tilde, so we have that this expression here, aggregate capital, the time derivative divided by a times l, is equal to this expression here in terms of uh, capital per units of effective labor. And now we see that we can plug in this expression here, up here in this expression, and then we get rid of all the aggregate variables in the time derivative of k tilde. Now if we do all these calculations, 
what we get is again the fundamental equation, but now of the solo swan model with technological progress and with population growth. This is the equation that we have here. Now we have the time derivative of capital per unit of effective labor is positively related to gross investment per unit of effective labor. So that's the saving rate multiplied by output per unit of effective labor, which is capital per unit of effective labor to the power of alpha. And we need to subtract effective depreciation now. What does this mean? We do not only have depreciation in the form that capital wears out at each point in time of capital per unit of effective labor, so that's the standard depreciation, but we also have the fact that if capital per unit of effective labor is defined as aggregate capital divided by the population size and by uh, the level of technologies, then if the denominator grows more quickly because population uh, growth is higher or the rate of technological progress is higher, then by definition capital per unit of effective labor accumulates uh, more slowly. Uh, so basically we can call this uh, capital dilution effect to some extent and that means that um, if we have faster population growth or faster workforce growth, then in order to equip these workers with the same amount of capital, we need a faster accumulation of capital altogether than in case we have a lower population growth rate or a lower rate of growth of the workforce. And that's basically a capital dilution effect. And just by definition of capital per unit of effective labor, it also applies to faster technological progress. So to summarize, we have here again on the left-hand side net investment, now in efficiency units of labor, which is the difference between gross investment and effective depreciation and capital dilution. So now again, if gross investment in efficiency units exceed cap effective depreciation and dilution in efficiency units, then capital per unit of effective labor accumulates, so the derivative is positive. And by contrast, if capital dilution and depreciation is higher than gross investment, then capital per unit of effective labor decumulates and the derivative is negative. And the good thing is that due to this transformation in efficiency units, we can now analyze the solo model with technological progress and with population growth in a similar manner as in, we had in the standard solo model without technological progress and without population growth, namely by drawing a diagram. And on this diagram, we draw uh, output per unit of effective labor on the vertical axis and capital per unit of effective labor on the horizontal axis. We can again um, draw here the concave curve of output per unit of effective labor as defined by capital per unit of effective labor to the power of alpha. Since alpha is smaller than one, we know that this is again concave. Then we can uh, draw the gross investment curve, which is the constant fraction s times output per worker or per capita here. And then we have again the capital dilution and depreciation line, n plus ga plus delta times k tilde here. Now again, from what we saw on the previous slide, we know that at some point these two curves will interact with each other because um, this term here is concave. So if capital per unit of effective labor increases, this becomes flatter and flatter. By contrast, this here is linear. So as capital per unit of effective labor increases, the slope here stays constant. But that means that as capital per unit of effective labor increases, at some point, these two terms will be exactly uh, the same and the time derivative of capital per unit of effective labor will be zero. And that's the case now at this point of intersection again, when the gross investment curve and the capital depreciation and capital dilution line intersect, because here at this point, the time derivative is zero and we have the steady state capital stock per unit of effective labor. So again, at this point, capital per unit of effective labor does not accumulate anymore. However, if we are to the left, if we start with a capital stock per unit of effective labor K0 that is lower than the steady state capital stock per unit of effective labor, we again have the fact that um, capital per unit of effective labor accumulates because here this term 
gross investment is higher than this term, capital dilution and capital depreciation. And that means capital will accumulate and we will converge to the steady state capital stock per unit of effective labor from below. The interpretation is again the same as in the version without technological progress and without population growth. We can have uh, a country that experienced a disaster or a war where the capital stock was destroyed. And then if it is farther away from its steady state capital stock due to this disaster or war, then it starts to accumulate capital per unit of effective labor at a faster pace. And that means that we will observe during this time period uh, also growth in output per unit of effective labor until we are at the new steady state. Well, again, back at the old steady state, if you will. And by contrast, if we start with a capital stock per unit of effective labor that is higher than the steady state capital stock per unit of effective labor, K0 tilde, then we have from the previous equation that gross investment is lower than capital depreciation and dilution, such that this term here is negative, and we have that capital per unit of effective labor decumulates, and we converge to the steady state capital stock per unit of effective labor from above. Now, this can be used, for example, to explain what happened after the Soviet Union collapsed, where the capital stock was artificially high due to forced investment and there was not so much uh, consumption going on and so on. And after the Soviet Union collapsed, the capital stock per unit of effective labor started uh, to decline. And we could then observe a decrease in output per unit of effective labor. Now remember, however, that in the background, uh, there could still be technological progress, which would lead to a positive uh, economic growth uh, rate. But this competes with the decline in capital per unit of effective labor. And it could very well be that for certain years or periods, uh, this effect of a decline in the capital stock per unit of effective labor outweighs the positive effect that we have due to any technological progress in the background when it comes to per capita GDP growth. And some claim that this situation occurred in the 1990s in the Soviet Union, where this decumulation of uh, capital, so this depreciation basically of capital um, after the collapse of the Soviet Union led to a situation where we had a fast decline in uh, the productive capital stock and therefore in some years even negative um, growth of per capita GDP. Now this line just summarizes verbally what we saw on the previous uh, graph, that if we are uh, to the left of the steady state capital stock per unit of effective labor, then gross investment exceeds capital dilution and depreciation, and the capital stock per unit of effective labor accumulates, increases. To the right, by contrast, gross investment falls short of capital dilution and depreciation, such that capital per unit of effective labor decreases. And only at the steady state level of capital per unit of effective labor, we have a constant uh, capital stock per unit of effective labor. And this is now the steady state in which all the variables in units of effective labor are constant. Now, however, we will see that this does not mean that the economy stagnates in, at this point because we have technological progress in the background. And that means that variables defined in per capita terms will actually grow at the rate of technological progress. And on the next slide, we will see um, how this um, works from a mathematical perspective. So if K tilde is constant, which is the case in, at the steady state, what we've just seen, then also capital, aggregate capital divided by the efficiency units of labor stays constant. So that means capital and efficiency units of labor have to grow at the same rate by definition. K tilde is constant, it has to hold that the numerator and the denominator of its definition grow at the same rate. Now, what we know is that the product of technology and labor grows at the rate of technological progress plus the rate of population growth, because we know that A grows at the rate GA, L grows at the rate N, so the product grows at the uh, sum of these two growth rates. And that means, just by definition, that aggregate capital also has to grow at the steady state at the rate of technological progress plus the rate of population growth. And the same holds true for all the other aggregate variables like aggregate GDP in the economy. Now, if we have the definition that uh, capital per unit of effective labor um, 
uh, that this stays constant, then we can, uh, from this definition, calculate per capita capital just by multiplying this expression by A. Because we know capital per capita is defined as aggregate capital divided by L. And then we know that this expression in the numerator has to grow at the rate of technological progress for this expression to stay constant. So that means that capital per worker has to grow at the rate of technological progress at the steady state. And that means that also output per capita and consumption per capita all have to grow at the rate of technological progress at this steady state. Now, we see that at this steady state now, there is growth in the per capita variables. And therefore, this is also called a balanced growth path, where the growth rates basically are constant. And the growth rates of per capita variables stay constant. And this growth rate is equal to the rate of technological progress. Now, we can summarize this in a table where we have all the variables uh, in aggregate uh, terms and in per capita terms and in uh, per unit of effective labor terms with the corresponding notation here and here the growth rate along the long run balance growth path. Capital per unit of effective labor, K tilde, does not grow at the long run steady state and output per unit of effective labor also does not grow at the long run steady state, which we already observed in the graph. Capital per worker and output per worker, however, they are capital per unit of effective labor and output per unit of effective labor multiplied by the stock of technologies, respectively. Then that means that these variables grow with the rate of technological progress, GA. The population size or the labor force we know by definition grows at the rate of population growth, N. And that implies that aggregate variables, so aggregate capital and aggregate output, actually grow at the rate of technological progress plus the rate of the population growth. The next thing we have a look at is again a comparative statics exercise, similar to the ones that we have performed in the basic version of the solar model without technological progress and without population growth. And here we consider an increase in the saving rate. Now we have again the standard diagram, and now the saving rate increases from S to S prime. And that implies a counterclockwise rotation of the gross investment curve around the origin. And again, this means that the gross investment curve, the new gross investment curve, intersects with the old capital depreciation and dilution curve at the higher level of the new steady state capital stock per unit of effective labor. So due to this shift, we get a higher capital stock per unit of effective labor in the new steady state. And that means that the economy starts from the old steady state to accumulate capital per unit of effective labor to converge to the new steady state. So during the transition phase, which again, in a technical sense, lasts um, uh, an infinite amount of time, but for all practical purposes and in simulations of the model, you are uh, already very close to the new steady state uh, after a few uh, simulated decades or so. So during this transition period, we observe an increase in capital per unit of effective labor and therefore an increase in output per unit of effective labor. During this period, the economy would grow even faster than the rate of technological progress at uh, during the transition, because at the steady state, the economy grows at the rate of technological progress. And during the transition, you have an additional boost from the accumulation of capital per unit of effective labor. Analogously, we can now describe what happens if another parameter changes, in this case, the population growth rate, and we consider an increase in the population growth rate from n to n prime. This means that the capital depreciation and capital dilution line shifts counterclockwise around the origin, and we now get a steeper curve here. And the steeper curve intersects the original um, gross investment curve in units of effective labor at the lower level of the capital stock per unit of effective labor at the steady state. So we get a new steady state capital stock per unit of effective labor that is lower than the original steady state capital stock per unit of effective labor. This in turn implies that during the transition we will observe a decumulation of capital per unit of effective labor and thereby a decrease in output per unit of effective labor. 
So during the transition to this new steady state, we would observe growth of per capita GDP that is smaller than growth of technological progress. And it could even be the case if this decumulation of capital per unit of effective labor is very fast, that output per capita decreases. If this decrease here outweighs the increase that we might have uh, in the stock of technologies due to technological progress at the constant rate GA. So to summarize, we now have again the changes in the saving rate and changes in the population growth rate. So parameter changes affect the steady state of the economy. And therefore, these differences in the parameters can explain level differences between economies um, in uh, the real world, basically. Now we can again summarize what we have learned by the model. Again, as in the standard case, we know capital accumulation alone is insufficient to explain long-run economic growth. The reason is the diminishing marginal product that we have of the production factor capital. So we need in the background the driving force of economic growth in the long run, and this is technological progress. Technological progress would lead to an increase in uh, labor productivity in the model, and this increase in labor productivity would imply that per capita GDP can uh, increase in the long run. At the moment, this rate in technological progress, uh, this rate of technological progress is exogenous, but it can be endogenized, which is done in the R&D-based um, endogenous and semi-endogenous and Schumpeterian types of growth models, which we might um, consider in other uh, videos. What's important, however, is that capital accumulation matters for the transition, so it can explain or ex can explain quite a large share of transitional growth. So it can explain the phenomenon of the economic miracle, for example, of Germany after the Second World War, as we see on the next slide. So here we again ask the question what we are able to explain now. So we are now able to explain the long-run trend growth in the United States and Germany by technological progress. So technological progress would lead these economies to grow over time at a remarkably constant rate. And this rate is remarkably similar in both economies also. Then we can explain again differences in the levels of uh, GDP between these two countries by differences in the structural variables, uh, like, uh, structural parameters like population growth rate, saving rate, rate of depreciation and so on. And we can explain the convergence phase in Germany after the Second World War by this fast capital accumulation, so this convergence process. Thank you again for your interest.